Well, welcome everybody. I'm Suzanne Goldberg, Executive Vice President for University Life at Columbia, and I'm so delighted to welcome everybody here to Awakening Our Democracy, the Politics of Gender. I want to welcome those watching the live stream as well as everybody in the room today. Uh, Awakening Our Democracy is Columbia's signature conversation series that focuses on race, ethnicity, disparities, justice, and other pressing issues of, to, of the day. And certainly today's panel is among, the topic of today's panel is among those very pressing issues. Uh, this, is, this series is brought to you by the Office of University Life. For those of you not already familiar with the office, it's an office that focuses on Columbia University as a community. We focus on student life issues across the schools, intellectual life at the university level, that is what kinds of conversations do we want to be having, including this one, and issues of community citizenship. And in this effort, we work with students, faculty, and administrators, and today's, uh, this series and today's event is co-sponsored by many of Columbia's centers, institutes, and other organizations. Uh, and today's, today's uh, discussion on the politics of gender comes at an especially notable time. As many of you are probably aware, even the issue of bathrooms has been much in the news with the South Dakota governor just vetoing a bill that would have restricted use of a bathroom uh, by students to uh, the, the uh, students w were going to be required to use a bathroom at school uh, only in connection with the sex that they were assigned at birth, not, who, not the way they identified. New York's mayor this week uh, 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 <coughs> excuse me, enact, signed an executive order that put the, that sort of reinforced the opposite policy, right? That people can use bathrooms in the city buildings and other specified locations that are consistent with their gender identity. Uh, but it's a complicated landscape, and although we're going to be talking about a very wide range of issues, I'm sure these, the, this piece of the conversation will come up as well. Uh, the, these issues come up often. Relate, the politics of gender is a, it can be a profound issue in educational settings as well as in employment settings. Many of you posed questions for today's panelists. Right? What, what, do, what do these issues, what does gender, masculinity, feminism, uh, and related issues. What do these issues have to do with the elections today? How do we think about the, the, the elections, the election time in which we find ourselves? What about in employment? What about in parenting? What about in higher education? So we'll be talking about all of this and more. Um, I'd like to now introduce our panelists and then turn it over to them. Uh, to my left is Vladimir Dutier, and he's our moderator. Vladimir is a CBS News correspondent who has covered numerous issues in the U.S., including the lack of economic opportunity for black men in Ferguson, uh, in Missouri, and internationally. Uh, he's previously served as CNN's correspondent in Lagos, Nigeria, for which he won a Peabody for co coverage of the Boko Haram kidnappings of hundreds of schoolgirls, and Vladimir is an alum of this very school, the journalism school where we are today. Uh, next to Vladimir is Dana Edel, and Dana is the executive director of SPARK. I'm sure she'll explain the acronym, but what I'll tell you is SPARK describes itself as uh, the uh, organization, a girl-fueled intergenerational activist organization that works to end the sexualization of girls and works to advance and ignite an anti-racist uh, an anti-racist gender justice movement. Dana also co-chaired the Girls Participation Task Force at the United Nations and teaches theater and activism at NYU and CUNY. And Dana is also an, uh, holds many degrees, is also an alum of Columbia, as she has an MFA in theater directing from Columbia School of the Arts. Uh, next to Dana is Cherno Biko. Uh, Cherno chairs the City of New York's Young Women's Advisory Council and was just this week, congratulations, recognized as, as part of Women's History Month for their advocacy on issues of racial equality, social justice, and LGBTQ rights. Cherno appears frequently in media and elsewhere to speak on these issues, and uh, we're delighted also to have you here. Chase Strangio is a staff attorney with ACLU's LGBT and AIDS Project. Chase focuses on legislative and administrative advocacy for LGBTQ people and people living with HIV across the United States. Um, Chase formerly directed the Prisoner Justice Initiatives for the Silvio Rivera Law Project here in New York and also founded an organization to provide direct bail and bond assistance to LGBTQ immigrants. 
and is also uh, a former or current, I guess, colleague of mine in doing a range of LGBTQ advocacy work. Professor Jen Kendall Thomas is also my colleague at the law school. Uh, he is the Nash Professor of Law at Columbia Law School, where he also directs the Center for the Study of Law and Culture. His teaching and research include U.S. and comparative law, constitutional law, human rights, critical race and feminist legal theory, law and sexuality, and many other areas, and is really an esteemed member of our law school faculty. Professor Thomas was vice chair of the Gay Men's Health Crisis Board of Directors and is a founding member of the Majority Action Caucus of ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. And I'm very delighted and appreciative to, have, to be able to turn the conversation over to Vladimir. Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne. Um, and thank you, Columbia University, for having me here. This is uh, really exciting. It's a great honor and I'm excited to take part in it. Uh, let me just give you a brief overview of how this session will go. Uh, we're going to first have a discussion here on the stage with our esteemed panelists. Uh, we're gonna ask them a couple of questions, or I will ask them a couple of questions and ask them to relate that back as to what they do and how they go about doing um, what they do with regards to their, their their professions and the things that they're focused on. Um, and then we're going to, at about uh, 12, 55 p.m. We're going to take some questions from the audience. The way that'll work is there are microphones that'll be set up in the back. Uh, three people will come up at a time to ask a question. I'll synthesize those questions and, and direct them to, to our panelists here. And this is meant to be, I, I tend to do these things, believe it or not, frequently for some reason. And um, I tend to keep the discussion very free flowing uh, because I'm not as smart. Uh, as the people that are here. Uh, and so I tend to ask very general questions. You guys are probably laughing because that's what reporters generally do. We're never as smart as the subjects that we're interviewing. Um, and so I, that's what I intend to do right now and sort of let them take the ball and run with it as we go through these. But there are a couple of, of overarching questions that we are going to focus on. And the first of those is, you know, what does gender and masculinity have to do with the current election cycle? Uh, the current election cycle is unlike anything I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, and so an issue like this is probably being drowned out because of the spectacle of what we're witnessing in American politics today, um, which is unfortunate. Um, but that is something that we're going to want to focus on. And also, how is gender meaningful today uh, as a political or social organizing identity or strategy? So those are sort of the overarching themes that we're going to focus on. But before we even get there, given this current political cycle, um, I want to ask our panel, I'll just go down the line, um, as it relates to your lives, as it relates to what you do, um, what is the most important issue uh, that we as Americans are not talking about when it comes to the politics of gender, and what can we do to change that, Dana? Um, I think we need... Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, hi, everybody. I think we need more voices at the table. So I'll talk a little bit about the work that I've been doing through that lens, and then we'll get to the, the deeper heart of your question. So I work with girls primarily um, under the age of 22, teenagers and undergraduate students, and I feel like their needs and desires and um, issues and challenges need to be at the forefront through their own voices. So we tend to listen to the people in power and the people who have the power to make the changes and we're not spending enough time um, actually listening to and hearing their stories. So for example, how do we get more young people engaged in politics and how do we get more of their voices? They're the ones who are gonna be growing up um, living the impact of the policies that are going to be implemented in this next election. So just a, a small example, we did a project at the United Nations this past fall with a group of teenage girls where they performed a piece that was written collaboratively by girls from over 30 countries around the world uh, talking about the issues that are impacting their lives and then having uh, local girls performing these stories in the UN in front of high level officials who are making policy decisions and policy recommendations was a really powerful and important way to ensure that we have a diversity of voices um, talking from their own experiences and telling their own stories about um, how racism, sexism, misogyny, um, homophobia, transphobia, all these issues are impacting their lives on a personal level. And so that's how I feel like we're gonna move forward is if we actually start to respect and listen to people's real stories. How has uh, um, Malala Yousafzai changed what you do? She's become very visible around the world and 
Uh, you've been doing this for quite some time, but she sort of ex has exploded onto the scene. Um, I, I'm guessing it's been a positive thing. Absolutely. I mean, Malala is an extraordinary, extraordinary young woman who uh, has definitely shifted a conversation about the ways that girls can advocate for the needs of other young women and girls. I think one of the challenges in looking to Malala as this one singular girl is it also perpetuates a narrative that girls are doing this alone as individuals. And Malala had a lot of support to be able to do what she was able to do from her family, from her own education. And I think what we're trying to do with Spark and also with other organizations and movements that I'm working with is really build a movement of a massive uh, movement of young people mobilizing together. So yes, it's important to have some faces and some figures that we can look to and respect, but we also have to remember that it doesn't, it's not about one person making the difference. It's about being inspired maybe by the one person, but making sure that we're creating a collective movement of feminist activism and engagement and really mobilizing millions of girls like Malala. All right, uh, Cherno, let me ask you the very same question. What is it that is the most burning issue or question that's not being addressed today in the United States? Thank you, Vladimir, um, and thank you all for coming here. I'm so excited to be here. I always do this when I start talking. Can y'all, can, let me hear you say, hey, Miss Biko. Hey, Miss Biko. Hey, Miss Biko. <laughs> say, hey, Miss Biko. Say, hey, hey Miss Biko. Biko. Thank you, okay, great. <laughs> Um, I just like to warm up the room. Thank you all for being here. It's such a beautiful day outside, um, and I, I wish I was out there. But I'm glad to, <laughs> I'm glad to be here with you. Um, the most burning issue for me, Vladimir, that's not being talked about in this election, and I think that it, it's starting to be talked about, um, is of course Black Lives Matter, right? So. Um, a lot of people think that Black Lives Matter doesn't have any um, political direction. But I think that we're starting to see that shift as we begin to interrupt the presidential candidates at their rallies, as we begin to release our own policy platforms, and as some people even begin to run for political office, right? Um, and so that's, that's really the the message that I came here today with is that Black Lives Matter. Now, Susan, thank you, <laughs> pulled me to the side and, and told me to keep it cute, but I really want to, <laughs> yeah, because um, I, I understand that we may not all be on the same page because some people don't believe that Black Lives Matter, right? And of course, I'm talking about Trump. Um, but but it, it, it's not just Donald Trump, and I think that we see um, this issue coming to head in, in the way that Donald Trump is winning so many primaries. People all across America agree with, with this rhetoric that, that black lives don't matter, that undocumented lives don't matter, that women's or LGBT lives don't matter. Um, and, it's, and it's very much giving me uh, circa 1930s Hitler right now. And so I. I love that uh, this event is called Awakening Our Democracy because I want everybody to wake up and see that if we keep going down this path, we're headed for destruction. So I'm going to keep it cute <laughs> and, we'll, <laughs> and we'll talk more about, about why that is. Um, but I, I really would love to continue this conversation about awakening our democracy and starting from a place that says black lives matter and that all black lives matter, right? And once we can begin to agree on that, then everybody's life will matter. All lives will matter. Thank you. In fact, that was a question I, I was going to ask you, Cherno. When I was in Ferguson, I first heard this uh, covering the protest over Michael Brown shooting. Um, people started to shout at the young people that were protesting, all lives matter. And at several Donald Trump rally events, uh, that's happened, where, where Black Lives Matter protesters have uh, gotten into Donald Trump's rallies, and they've been surrounded by Mr. Trump's supporters shouting, all lives matter. What is it that people who say that don't understand about black lives, the movement of Black Lives Matter? Well, I think that people who respond to the declaration that black lives matter by saying all lives matter, they're really missing the mark. And, and here's why, because if all lives matter, we wouldn't have seen 
what happened in Ferguson, right? I come from Ohio. I was just talking with, uh, is it Barbara Chin? Where's Barbara? Hey, boo. <laughs> I was just talking. Barbara has family in Cincinnati, and I was born in Columbus. And I love Ohio so much. We have great, uh, like, geography. We have the Ohio River to the south, and we have uh, the Great Lakes to the north. But one of the things that made me escape Ohio and move to New York last year is because it was so clear to me that my life was in more danger. And I think that it's because of the system of policing that really was perfected in Ohio as African slaves tried to cross that river and seek liberation. Um, and so our, the policing system that we have in this country is rooted in anti-blackness. It's rooted in um, like fugitive slave catchers. And so time and time again in Ohio, we saw black unarmed people getting gunned down. I'm thinking about Tamir Rice, a 12 year old boy in Cleveland, and the police pulled up and shot him within 12 seconds. You can't have stuff like that going on and still say that black lives matter. I'm thinking about Tanisha Anderson, who was a woman who struggled with mental illness and her family called to get her help and the police killed her. So when we think about awakening our democracy and how gender plays into it, how, how are black women stereotyped and how are we perceived that the police will pull up on someone who struggles with mental illness and shoot them? I'm thinking about John Crawford in Dayton. He was in Walmart trying to buy a toy gun right and someone called the police and said there's a black man in here with a gun and the police came into walmart and shot john crawford dead in the toy aisle right i'm thinking about the four black trans women in ohio in 2014 who were murdered and their names were betty skinner and Brittany nicole kid sturgis and cc dub and tiffany edwards and nobody talks about them and so uh, I would say um, to the people who say all lives matter, when we say black lives matter, it would be like showing up to a breast cancer rally and, and start screaming about how prostate cancer needs more funding. You don't do that. You don't show up to my funeral talking about how you know how loss feels too, but I'm gonna keep it cute, Susan. <laughs> We're gonna come back and talk about that because I think it's a real important issue. Um, Chase, let me ask you, uh, what is it that you feel or what you see in your day-to-day -day at the ACLU, for example, that is not being addressed and should be? Yeah, so, so again, thank you so much uh, all for being here and for including me in this important conversation. And, it, you know, it's always hard for me to follow Cherno because I, I, I have learned so much, you know, from her. And, and I think, you know, grounding us in a conversation about the criminal legal system is, is the imperative thing to do here. Um, when, I, when I think about how, what are the politics of gender and sort of how, you know, what's missing from the conversation, I really, for me, a lot of what's missing is the way in which our legal rules, whether that's our sort of legislative rules, our court decisions, our administrative matrix of rules sort of shapes who can occupy the status of woman or the status of man and then what types of violence are is exerted both from the state and then from others um, for people who transgress outside of that. And so that the very act of talking about sort of what is gender and who can be a man and who can be a woman is constituting those very ideas of man and woman and so many people are left out of that. And, and I think one really you know, salient example for me is that in this, in this moment, we're seeing a lot of progress, we, you so, sort of so-called so progress with respect to you know, encompassing trans people within sort of the, the ideas of sex discrimination and sort of covering with legal protections the trans community, um, in, including yesterday or earlier this week, uh, the mayor's executive order with respect to restrooms and, uh, and locker rooms. But I think what's really missing from this conversation is while the law is making that progress, the place where we're not seeing any changes is in the criminal legal system. The reality is that forever and in all places, the police and the prison officials who cage people in this country will assign people um, based on you know the sex they were assigned at birth, will control bodies based on uh, people's race. And so when I think about gender, I think about, you know, the ability to access and control um, a person's body and person's self uh, definition of who they are. And so when we're talking about the politics of gender, I think we should be talking about how our very conversations about gender are excluding people and are 
um, really reinforcing the very power dynamics that make it more likely that black trans women are murdered, that black men are murdered by the police. And so we have to be really careful in, in, our, in, our, in our gendered conversations for sort of how we constitute the very ideas that, that we're talking about. Chase, do you ever feel that in light of the recent landmark Supreme Court decision, uh, but that the, for every step forward, there's two steps back? Does it ever feel like that? Yeah, so the landmark Supreme Court decision um, and, and, and backlash. It, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's, one, that, that's one way to look at it, and it's important to think about, you know, sort of what are the costs of our decisions, particularly as a lawyer. I think something that's important for me to remember is every time we move forward with a legal advocacy strategy, we are, there are going to be serious costs to our decisions. So it's not, so there's, there's a way to look at it as backlash. You know, yes, you know, there's so-called progress that you're seeing the LGBT community make at the Supreme Court or elsewhere, um, but, but also in, in creating our discourses in our legal advocacy, in sort of telling the narrative of same-sex uh, relationships and access to marriage, we're forming what it means to be sort of a legally legitimate LGBT person and leaving out from that conversation, you know, people who transgress from that, people of color in particular, trans people in particular, trans women of, co of, of color especially. And so I think we are to blame in many ways for the backlash, those of us who are pursuing the advocacy, advocacy myself included. And I think it doesn't mean that we don't do the advocacy. It doesn't mean that we don't engage and reform the system, but it means that in doing so, we do it with an understanding that we will create harms. We will cause pain to some people and we will leave people out. And we should be very transparent about that. And pretending it's not happening is doing nobody any favors. Um, uh, Professor Thomas, I'm going to ask you to be my anchor. As you listen to the discussions that we've just had, um, so I'm going to ask you to add your thoughts to what you've just heard, but also uh, ask you as well the most important issue that's not being discussed right now. And I want to add one last thing. You're a professor. You can handle it. Um, which This is how I felt at Columbia. That's what the professors would do to me. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Nancy Reagan will be laid uh, to rest tomorrow. I want you to get, I want you to offer up some perspective on what it was like when President Reagan was in office um, and as you are heavily involved in uh, the, the AIDS um, memorial in New York City. I want to get your perspective on, on that era and where we are today. All right, well maybe I'll take uh, that second question about Nancy Reagan. Um, on, on another round. Yeah, okay. Uh, because the, the first thing you asked me to do um, is going to take me a little time to, <laughs> to wrap my mind around. Uh, but I think you're right that uh, this is a, a, an opportunity to really step back a little bit uh, from the specific question that you've put to the other panelists about their work and try to tie together um, the, the really important ideas and terms in the title of the panel, Awakening Democracy, the Politics of Gender. And when we try to think about the relevance of the idea of democracy, the idea of politics, and the idea of gender, as it's related to the current uh, election cycle, what resonates for me is less specific policy issues than broader issues of what might be called symbolic politics. Yesterday I went to visit a friend who uh, is in the hospital at the hospital for special surgery. And when I arrived, my friend who is uh, someone who socially identifies as a woman was sitting and talking with two other friends who are more or less the same age as she. These are all women uh, in their 60s, white women in their 60s. And uh, we talked about a bunch of things. We talked about the, um, the OJ miniseries on FX. Uh, we talked about uh, the Netflix series House of Cards. And uh, we talked about Hillary Rodham Clinton and uh, the primaries, uh, the Michigan primary uh, in particular. And I mentioned to them a piece that I had read online in which the criticism of Secretary of State Clinton was offered that she's too transparently tactical and that um, her campaign choices look as though they're all moves on a chessboard. And my friend replied to my summary of that article 
Well, if she were a man, right, no one would be saying that. That would be seen as a strength, right? Um, as evidence of her political skill and political intelligence. And I thought that one of the enduring uh, truths, even in this moment in which more women are involved as officials in our public political life than ever before, this election cycle has confirmed for me yet again something that's been true about the Republic since its founding, namely that in this country, men are over-identified with politics. Right? Political life is understood as an arena of our public life that is populated principally by men. Right? So if we start from that, that historical fact, which I think is true of our public life today, then there's a sense in which our democracy has always been a gendered democracy. It hasn't always been a gender democracy, but it's always been a gendered democracy. And I think the most important thing for us to uh, reckon with, or one of the most important things at a minimum to reckon with, is the fact that in this election cycle, as in our political life generally, gender matters. Right? Now, that is not to say that whenever we're talking about gender, though, we're talking about women. Right? Um, and I will simply flip from Hillary Rodham Clinton to the other party and the candidates uh, for the nomination of the other party, who are very much running, symbolically again, on a gender platform when they can talk about the size of one another's hands, right? um, and when they can frame the goal of their campaigns solely in terms of winning, right? when they can talk about taking America back in um, you know, a dog whistle politics in which everyone knows that the people who are going to be the take, doing the taking are those of us who identify as white, heteropatriarchal, masculine men, right? Uh, then I think the question of the centrality of gender as an idea, as a way um, in which all of us imagine politics, is an issue that we should be talking about more. Because as a frame for understanding the current election cycle, I cannot think of another idea in which gender can help us understand more of what I think in many ways is um, an insane cycle, right? Um, whether we're talking about race, transgender issues, women's issues, if we look through this um, lens of gender, through the gender optic, we're able to understand a lot of what's going on, the performances of um, testosterone-fueled masculinity, the open sexism uh, with which candidates of one party have talked about not only other candidates, but uh, media uh, commentators and others. That, I think, is central. And we will miss a lot of what is going on if we see the issue of gender in this election cycle as being only about Hillary Rodham Clinton and the potentially transformative effect that her election, if it happens, would have. The outcome of this election, no matter how we view it, is going to be about the future of gender democracy and what kind of gender democracy we will have. You know, you mentioned the term dog whistle politics. I, I, to me, Donald Trump is not blowing a dog whistle. He is the id of the Republican Party writ large for the American people to see. And the question then becomes, because throughout the years they've engaged in what you're talking about, now all of a sudden you have a candidate who is saying the things that a lot of people in politics were thinking but didn't say in polite company. Now they can't control him. They needed those votes. They needed those people to come out to those rallies because they thought that he was going to go away. He's not going away. Now we're confronted with this. And even in the way that I heard him recently talk about, wait until I get to Hillary. The very aggressive nature that he talked about, I'm, wait until you see what I do with her. The menace there. 
was something I've never seen in politics. Forget about the fact that he talked about the size of his penis on, on a, a stage where people are running for the presidency. I, don't, I want to throw that back to you guys. Well, I think there is a violence, a symbolic violence. And as we know, for those of us who followed the campaign rallies and uh, other events, real physical violence that we've seen in this presidential election cycle that I have no memory of in my adult lifetime. I simply have no reference um, in past elections to point to here. And that, I think, um, ought to remind us of the tight connection historically in this country uh, between men, those who are socially identified as men, and violence. And there is a sense, you're right when you say id, in which Mr. Trump represents the eruption of a political unconscious in this country uh, that is not above using violence, whether it's verbal violence, rhetorical violence, or actual physical violence to achieve its goals. And the dangers to our democracy of that kind of gendered violence as um, a central tool for achieving political ends I think cannot be overestimated. Uh, Turner, what do you think of that? I mean, the, the fact that if, if, if that is to be believed, and that clearly is what is happening right now, the issues that we've all been talking about are not ever going to come to the forefront because clearly that's not on the agenda. Right. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to be cute. You, can <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't want me to be cute? Okay, so. You can be real. <laughs> okay. Here's the, the deal. I think what we're seeing now is people are having to make a choice. I, I feel like I have to make this choice every day. But it's the choice between like reformation and transformation, right? So I struggle with um, how can we affect change from inside the system? How can just exactly what Chase was talking about from like a provider standpoint or someone who services the community. Um, but also something that you should be thinking about as you navigate your time here at Columbia University, how can we truly begin to affect change in the institutions where we're invested, right? So <clears throat> a while back, I was like, I'm not voting anymore. I know like, you know, they always say, so, so many black people die for our right to vote, they would be ashamed. Um, that's what my mom told me. And I was like, mom, if you like believe that, um, I will sell you my vote. And, and, and I did, I sold it for like $10. And um, <laughs> here's the reason why. Because I feel like if we're thinking um, in a transformative way about politics, right? To me, I'm just thinking about why do we vote on a Tuesday? People have to work. You know, like we should we should vote on Saturday and Sunday, like have a whole weekend. We'll turn it into a party. We should have the the option or the ability to vote online. There are still so many ways in which we're suppressed and our voices aren't heard. And I think that it's important to think about how we can begin to transform these systems that are built um, to oppress us. Um, and so that's like what I'm what I'm struggling with. It's important to note that the way in which it has been done before has not been cute. Revolution is not cute. Um, I always think about like Harriet Tubman. I consider myself an abolitionist, right? And so I'm thinking, um, how can we get our people free? And Harriet Tubman, once she got free, she went back to the South 19 times and got, they, they some, they say over a thousand people to freedom. Um, and to do that, she had to carry a shotgun. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, we see the unrest that's happening in Ferguson. We see the unrest, even in Missouri, bringing it back to the college students and the people who are invested in academia. Once we begin to see um, like alliances between activists and people who are um, pushing social justice, and, but that combined with sports, I think the thing that was so important to me about Missouri was that the football team said, we're not playing no more. And they made the president of that university resign. And so it's really, we have to ask ourselves every day, are we gonna keep putting up with this? 
let me ask you, Chase and, and Dana, uh, that must, you know, there are people who are dropping out of the political system because they say, you know what, this is, there's a fundamental problem with the entire system and I don't want to participate in that. That must make what you do difficult and also for you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I think one of the problems with democracy as a system is that supposedly we the people are electing a singular person to make change and thinking about it in terms of gender and masculinity and I think a lot of what um, Professor Thomas was saying about the, the violence and somewhat aggressive nature that we're seeing in some of the candidates, Donald Trump in particular, who has actually said things like, when elected, I will bring torture back. And then when he gets challenged on that by saying, but that's actually, the military can't do that. It's not legal for them. He's like, oh, they'll listen to me because I'll be in charge. They'll listen to me. So this idea that there is power in one person and that that's our, the goal of democracy is that we say we choose this person to have power as an individual versus what we've been talking about of mobilizing a football team, a masses, saying what if the people reclaim the power and actually enact the change to topple the dictator leader, which we're moving towards, frighteningly so. Um, and, you know, we're punishing Bernie Sanders for saying the word socialist and for um, speaking in any way about looking at this country as a country made up of masses that actually want justice and equality and fairness and uh, a shared power. So I think we need to be having those deeper conversations about um, how democracy actually is played out and some of the real dangers of our democratic system. I mean, I, I guess I would just add to the, this conversation that it, one of the things that's actually more frustrating to me than people dropping out of, of sort of the voting process, since so many people that I care about are excluded from it already, whether that's because of immigration status or criminal convictions or other things. Um, so I don't think we're in any way a democracy that represents the people, no matter how you slice it that um, when the, the, the reality is that the rules and the people that govern people's lives are actually so much more local than they are federal. And I think the federal election is, is you know, the presidential election is a huge stage, but of course, many of these things have been said in state legislatures, on school boards, and elsewhere since you know, the, our government was, was started and have continued. And I think the, you know, the right, however you sort of think about it, has very strategically infiltrated school boards and local city governments and state governments, said many of these same things, introduced many toxic, harmful laws. I mean, the, the things that you read in state legislatures are terrible. I mean, castrating people accused of sex offenses, convicted of sex offenses, um, you know, taking, you know, having English only language in schools. I mean, so many different insidious, toxic things that have been going on for a very long time. It's hard to look at the federal, you know, presidential election as really anything different than what's been playing out in, in sort of the actual governing mechanisms of people's lives, um, particularly because police offices, uh, corrections offices, jails, you know, city governments, those things are also controlling how people are able to live or not live. And so I think. One thing I'm worried about is that the way in which we've sort of fixated on this particular presidential election has obscured conversations about very harmful things that are playing out every day. Uh, Professor Bell, I, I, going back to some of the comments you made earlier, um, so then how, would, how do we account for the rise of Barack Obama in 2008, but also remembering that Hillary Clinton was his primary opponent then? And there was that moment, if some of you will recall, where the way the media reported it is that we saw her soften. We saw her become, a, you know, she said, oh, it's hard. And she all of a sudden became from, you know, what people perceived her to be, which is a very tactile strate strategist politician, to a grandmother or a mother at the, at the time. Um, and now she's running again and facing some of those very same criticisms. I guess the question is, you know, we had a, a black president, we have a woman who is running for the presidency, but yet we're still dealing with some of the things that you're talking about. Should she, if she succeeds, what will that mean? <laughs> well, great question. Um, that's first time though I've been called Professor Bell. What did uh, I say? Dirk though is my uh, hero, professor. so I'm, Sorry. I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> moved more than I can say. Um, to have been misnamed in that way. Yes, Thank Professor Tom, sorry. <laughs> uh, that's quite all right. Um, well, look, Barack Obama was elected in 2008, at least in part because we were facing what appeared to be the most 
uh, potentially damaging financial crisis, economic crisis, that this country had faced since the 1930s Great Depression. It was a moment of deep crisis in um, our economic order and our political order, uh, which I choose to call our neoliberal economic and political order. Right? The de democratizing um, decades which removed uh, from democratic decision making power over large questions about the future of the American economy, about the kinds of uh, allocations of our resources uh, that we should be making, um, which uh, imposed austerity and a retrenchment of basic elements of the social welfare state. That development, um, it seemed to me, created an opening for the election of then Senator Obama. Now, um, and also the exhaustion, I might add, with uh, um, eight years, arguably almost two decades, of neoconservative uh, politics at the national level uh, from the White House. What will change? Uh, what would change? I think we need to put that in the conditional. What would change with the election of Hillary Clinton? Um, if I answered you honestly, and I'm going to take a risk uh, and do that, uh, I think I would have to say all the signs suggest, if we look at her political career, all the signs suggest that not much would change and that uh, she would continue to uh, pursue policies that were in sync with the neoliberal playbook that Mr. Obama has largely followed. Right? Uh, Mr. Obama used the language of political transformation and on a symbolic level there was a transformation. I do not want to be understood as uh, denying that the election of the first socially identified African American uh, president was not transformative. Uh, but um, as the French say, plus ça change. Plus c'est la même chose. Things change, but they stay the same. Um, it is, in fact, uh, the case that throughout most of his presidency, uh, African Americans, just to take one, one group, have been by all of the chief indicators worse off under the Obama administration than they were before the election. So I think what we have learned. Uh, from the Obama presidency and uh, what, uh, if it's a lesson we've learned, we would be foolish not to take into um, a Clinton, a second Clinton administration if there is one, is that there are limits to a certain kind of identity politics, right, which don't go to the heart of some of these questions of structural inequality, of structural exclusion, which are not just about who's occupying office, but about the substance of the policies that they're pursuing. Uh, that's the transformation that I think we, we need. Um, and if, in fact, uh, we are on the brink of the possibility of a different kind of gender democracy, merely electing a woman to be the face of the office of the presidency is not going to touch um, these broader structural issues of gender, uh, gender inequality with which this country has grappled since the founding of the republic. And yeah, and there's also the danger of, again, having this singular person who's supposed to represent all of the change. So our post-racial world now that, well, we elected a black president, so therefore there can't be racism in the U.S. anymore, whereas we heard from Cherno many, many, many examples, and there are many, many, many more of black lives not actually mattering. So a fear of if we have a pr another President Clinton, President Hillary Clinton, is that then we'll sit back with complacency and say, oh, we don't have a gender issue in this country anymore. Look, the U.S. elected a woman. Uh, they must have achieved gender justice, whereas we know by every single marker the U.S. is is, I think, 47th, ranked 47th out of the top 47 countries in the world on gender equality. So 
in some ways it becomes dangerous in our neoliberal world to focus on these individuals and saying that because we're allowing this one person to rise, that in itself is gonna just trickle down and change the way we think socially about um, identity, it's about gender, about race, and that's... Doesn't that mean, doesn't that right mean though, if, if Donald Trump should be the GOP nominee and be elected president of the United States, that we would still see a continuation of the same policies that we've seen for the last 50 years, that all the things that he is saying on the campaign trail, which are dangerous and incendiary, but would not change at all the minute he stepped into the Oval Office, because I have a lot of friends who, you know, two or three years into President Obama's election were emailing me and saying, you see, he's not Jesus. And I said, well, I never, I don't know anybody who ever said that Barack Obama was going to be Jesus, you know, Christ come to earth. That, but that's how a lot of Americans perceive the movement that elected him to the presidency. He is just another Chicago politician who happens to be African American. That's sort of the way I've always looked at it. I feel, I wonder if it's the same with any of these other candidates with the exception of perhaps Bernie Sanders because he does represent a fundamental shift from what we've seen in the past. Although the labeling of an outsider, the guy's been in Washington for 30 years, so that's another thing. But I don't, I'm gonna throw that back to the panel and just anybody can take that. I mean, the, the question, the question of, of, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I met Hillary Clinton. Uh, last year at the National Council for Negro Women. It was like a big to-do. Um, and I wasn't impressed. I didn't walk away feeling like um, this, this white woman who is invested in neoliberal politics and accepts money from big corporations um, and is invested in the incarceration of black people and um, I, I wasn't impressed. Um, and she was my greatest hope, like Barack Obama was in 2008. Um, and I always think about last year, they, they have pride receptions at the White House in June um, and they invite all these LGBT folks. And last year, uh, one of my friends snuck, well, she did, yeah, she did, she snuck in. Um, <laughs> she snuck in uh, to the White House uh, to go to this pride reception. Uh, her name was Genesette Gutierrez, and she's an undocumented trans Latina woman. And when the president started speaking, she interrupted him and began shouting, um, free our prisoners, um, stop killing trans women, um, trans undo undocumented lives matter. Um, and President Obama, this is the one where he said, not in my house, and had her escorted out. But what struck me the most was all of these like um, white, gay men who were primarily there started booing her. And it reminded me so much about how our movement shifted after 1969 and Stonewall when trans women of color, specifically black and Latina trans women, rebelled against the police and ignited this movement and not long after that were then discarded, right, and thrown away so that we could focus on marriage equality. And I think that we'll begin to see that shift in so many of our movements as people are bought off and as people join this political circus, um, I think we'll, we'll see that happen again. It'll be more of the same. So Wait, Chase, can I just, yeah, yeah can I add, just, I mean, I think as a litigator, I, I feel, it would, it would feel remiss if I didn't sort of jump in to say that I, I do think, and I don't, in many, many indicators, I think the reality of our political system is that who is in the presidency is not going to have a huge effect on many different things. I do think it will on our federal court system. And, and I think as much as, you know, change isn't happening in the federal courts in many ways, change can, you know, you can create openings through federal court litigation, the Supreme Court, but, but all the way down to the federal district courts. And, you know, when, when I file a case, it barely matters what I, you know, I, I guess this is videotape. Well, you know, it, it, all that matters is the judge that you draw, right? I mean, so, the, so I think that the way that our legal system will be you know, co constituted will, will, will be affected by who, who is in the office of the presidency and then who is appointed to every executive agency. Um, you know, I, re I represent Chelsea Manning, for example, and I always think about, you know, what, you know, she was not treated well in, <laughs> by the Obama administration and continues to not be treated well by the Obama administration. I think she could be also treated much worse by, by another uh, administration. And so I, I think 
for me, I think there's incredible limits to what we can do in terms of reform, um, but I think the ability to make room for the type of transformative change that I believe in and that I think that, that Cherno was talking about is impacted by who's sitting in, the, who, who occupies the federal judgeships and who's appointed to run executive, federal executive agencies. Um, so I worry about that. Um, and, and for that reason, I think our votes matter where we can vote. All right, we are going to, to uh, start to open it up for questions. Uh, so the way it's gonna work is there are going to be microphones. I don't see them now, but uh, well, there they are. Um, microphones at the back of the room there. And what we'll do is uh, three people will come up, students, we're asking students to come up and uh, ask a question. Um, and then I will synthesize those questions and direct them to the panelists. If there's a particular panelist that you would like to address the question, just let me know. Hello, um, um, thanks. Well, thanks for showing up, I really enjoyed the panel. Um, one of the things that was addressed was um, how Hillary, when she's being um, um, tactical or when she's trying to reach out to a certain community to get votes, um, she's often criticized. But um, I would argue that at some times we see that these methods are distasteful. Um, as far as, um, I remember one of, um, I remember, I remember one time when I was looking um, at Hillary's campaign trail, she started trying to identify with a Hispanic grandmother, and that didn't really sit well with me because I felt that she was almost pandering to, to like a specific audience. And when she was challenged on the sins of her past as far as her contributions to mass incarceration, by um, individuals affiliated with the Black Lives Matter movement. She was very dismissive, but when we see her in front of the camera, she acts like she's, all right, um, this, this, this warrior for this type of social change. So um, I wanna know, like, what is, your, what is your ideas on that? Do you feel that to a certain extent when she reaches out to a lot of communities, it is, um, it is, more or less of um, almost exploiting um, individuals' um, fears and, and things of that nature? Or do you feel that this is just the language of politics? Thank you. We're, so we're gonna take three questions at once and then we're gonna, we're gonna sort of synthesize them and then um, ask our panelists. So thank you very much for that question. Yes, ma'am. Hello, thank you. Ana Gonzalez from the School of International and Public Affairs. I would uh, like to ask our panelists if they can talk more about the ways that we can organize um, and as citizens affect our, our democracy and, and the social change that, that we want to see. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Julia Sainz. I'm in Columbia College. My gender pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm from Colombia and I would want to know your opinion on the intersectionality between gender politics and immigration and these coming elections. Thank you. Okay, three really, really great questions there. Um, so the first one is actually kind of, the last two are, are, are more similar than the first. The first question, the language of politics, the exploitation that politicians use when when they go into Chicago versus when they are in Kansas or wherever they happen to be campaigning. And it may, uh, your question made me remember the debate last night. I don't know who saw the debate last night, but there was a question asked, very simple question to both Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. Is Donald Trump a racist? Well, here's what I think. And you know, but they went on with their platform. Not one of, not either of them said, the things that he said, he's a racist. Anybody else who said those things would be considered a racist. So, yes, what is, that, what is it with that language that is used um, when it comes to politics? And, and I'll even give President Obama, I've seen President Obama slip into the black vernacular when he's in you know, one neighborhood and then he's Barry from Hawaii when he's somewhere else, you know, so. Um, I think it's an interesting question about performance and authenticity in politics. Where are you? That, it's funny that Hillary gets critiqued for not being authentic when she's making attempts to connect with people different from herself. Trump gets commended for being authentic, 
even when his authenticity could not be more violent, horrific, racist. So would we prefer authentic evil or would we prefer attempts at connection that might ring false but are attempts to connect beyond I am a middle class white woman so therefore I have no right to try to speak to anybody who does not share my same identity. So I think we need to unpack those questions around um, what we expect of politicians and what we're rewarding and what we're critiquing. Anybody else want to add to that? All right, so the other question, sorry, go ahead, Professor. I'm, I actually wanted to address one of the other questions. Okay, yeah, so the, the, the other questions are about the intersectionality between immigration uh, and, and gender and uh, the uh, organization and how it's possible for people to get organized because I've also seen many of those instances where a lone protester will get into a political speech or five of them will, will get there and then they're, they're unceremoniously escorted out I'm cognizant of investing too much into one person. There are a lot of people who are waiting still for the Martin Luther King Juniors and the Malcolm X's of the world and others who say, no, we don't need that one singular person. We need to do it together. It's really a difficult question. I mean, I don't know where the answer lies. Well, I want to talk about the doing it together, and I thank the, the person who asked uh, that question for asking it. Uh, this past weekend, I was fortunate enough to uh, be part of an incredible gathering here on this campus, the sixth annual Beyond the Bars conference, which is a, a gathering uh, of a diverse group of folk who uh, come together out of a common concern about and a shared commitment to dismantling this country's prison industrial complex and to addressing uh, the ways in which the way we do prisons in this country have effects not only on those uh, devastating effects on, on those who are um, in prison, but also on the families and communities from which uh, they come. And uh, one of the things that I had hoped uh, might be something around which uh, that movement and its allies could organize um, is this specific question of how in this country we might change the way uh, we do prisons, uh, or the ways in which that constituency and its allies might organize to think about what kind of political mobilization would we have? How would we think of ourselves as citizens, whether we're formally citizens uh, or not? How would we think of ourselves as stakeholders in U.S. political society if we centered, right, if we centered the um, figure of formerly incarcerated people and their families. If we centered the question of the prison, right? If we truly believed uh, that the decency of a society could be measured in one important respect by what kind of prisons it had. Uh, that, it seems to me, is an issue which ties together uh, not only uh, the, 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 the questions that are at the center of the Black Lives Matter movement, but also of immigration, just to take two examples. Um, and also bears in a profound way on questions of democratic justice, specifically with respect to distributive justice and how we allocate the public fisc. Right? We spend an enormous amount of money incarcerating people. Now we've seen uh, what appears to be a temporary convergence of interest between progressive uh, prison abolitionists and the right. Uh, but it's not just about money. It's a question of fundamental democratic justice. Why is it in this country that states are allowed to deny the right to vote permanently to people who have served time in prison? I think that that, that is a, an issue that all of us should care about and around which all of us could organize in a coalition that pulls together several different issues and concerns at once in a powerful way, both with respect to, way, with respect to how we imagine what it means uh, to strive toward democracy and pragmatically around a specific set of problems and policy solutions to them. Uh, Senator Sanders has made that 
one of his platforms, the, rep, the reforming of the prison system in the United States. He's for Secretary Clinton to tilt left to address that as well. Authentic or inauthentic, Senator Sanders? You know, I'm not really, um, I don't really care a whole lot uh, about this jargon of authenticity, right? Um, I think that one of the great mistakes that we have made in this country, uh, a mistake which has been encouraged in large part by the powerful role that uh, the media, the news media, which has basically now become an entertainment media, plays in our political life, is thinking that these are people uh, that we ought to want to sit down and share a beer or a burger with. When did that change? Because I don't think anybody looked at FDR and said, you're a migrant in Oklahoma, you have anything in common with this blue-blooded, you know, New Yorker who, but he somehow was able to fix your life in the 30s. When did it all of a sudden veer to, yeah, I want to hang out with my politicians because I want them to be just like me? Well, I would, I would date it, you raised the question of Nancy Reagan earlier, um, I would date it to the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Uh, there's a marvelous book uh, that was written some years ago by Michael Rogan, which for me just perfectly encapsulates the significance for our political life of the Reagan administration. And the book is called, quite simply, Ronald Reagan, the Movie. Right? Uh, that, I think, was a paradigm shift in our political life in which um, we have progr progressed. I think that the Trump presidency is a symptom of, um, uh, of our inability to separate the individual from the character he plays on television. I think a lot of the people who are attracted to uh, the idea of a Trump presidency and who are attracted to the person of Donald Trump are attracted, in fact, to this image of the character that he is perpetually playing. Right? And this um, absolute collapse of our politics and of celebrity culture, the, the, the flattening of our political life, which um, I was watching, this was a shock to me, I was watching, I don't have a TV, so the other night I was at a dinner party um, and we decided to watch some of the post-primary um, election coverage. And it was shocking to me how much of the way these journalists talked about the elections was totally in terms of the horse race. The only exception to that, where some conversation took place about voters, voters' interests, voters' desires, was in fact on Fox News, right? uh, which was for me um, quite surprising. So we live in a moment in which um, we, don't have a way to center even the voter <laughs> in the electoral process because it's become so much about the individual candidate. And um, unfortunately, I think um, Senator, Secretary of State, I mean, uh, Clinton uh, has been handicapped in large part uh, by her relative inability or perhaps her unwillingness uh, to play that celebrity politics game. She does talk about issues in the same way uh, that Senator Sanders does, in ways that harken back to a way of doing politics, which I think um, has become, sadly, um, and, and, and I think to, um, uh, we're going to find to our great cost, outmoded. And you know, you, you know I, 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 we have TVs on in the CBS newsroom. We're not a cable channel like MSN or the others, but I do recall the other day, uh, Donald Trump delivering his remarks at the infomercial, if you guys saw it, with the steaks and the water and all that other stuff. And every cable channel was carrying that, and Secretary Clinton was delivering her remarks after her win, and they were all you know, policy discussions that she was having, and not one cable network carried it. We just sat there and watched the guy talk about the steaks, and the, you know, I thought that was pretty remarkable as well. I don't know if anybody wanted to add to, to this before we ask. We asked our audience for more questions. Well, I, I, or do you want to yeah, go first? Please. Yeah. Um, okay. So I wanted to hop in on uh, your piece, the uh, intersectional piece. So I work with the Young Women's uh, Advisory Council for the City of New York, and one of our co-chairs for our data working group is Kimberly Crenshaw, and she coined the term intersectional. And I don't want to get too big here, but do we know what intersectionality means? Good. So a lot of times they, they tell me to show up, but they don't want all of me. 
Like, I can show up to a black space, but I can only be black. They don't want me to be LGBT. Or I can show up to uh, an LGBT space, but I can only bring my trans self. I can't bring my black self. I can't bring a, an analysis of race into it. And so I think it's so important that um, we can bring all of ourselves. You asked the question about what does gender and documentation have to do about this. I'm going. Um, out to California in a couple of weeks to a conference called Undocu Black. And it's, and it's focusing on the 500,000 undocumented black people that we have in this country. And my thing is, the reason why I wanna work more closely with this community is because I consider myself undocumented. Ohio is one of the last states that refuses to allow trans people to change their birth certificate. And so without the documentation uh, that reflects our gender identity, our gender expression, and who we really are, we can't get jobs, we can't travel. Um, sometimes we're taken to the wrong jails, even though jails are bad, period. And so um, I, I just think that it's so important to bring an intersectional lens to it because they told us you know, city council the, and the speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, she said, we want to empower all young women in New York City. And I said, oh, great. So, you know, as a black trans woman, I can be empowered too. And they said, yeah, come on. Um, and so I came, but when we started working there, we started noticing all these gaps. Where are the other trans people? Where are the undocumented people? So I started asking them, why aren't y'all coming? Um, and without those people at the table, without them in the room, no one else thought about undocumented people can't get past the security to get in City Hall, right? Undocumented people don't have the clearance to, to, work, with, to work with this initiative. Um, and, and the trans women who are trying to come don't have documentation that reflects who they are, so they're not gonna let them in for the Young Women's Initiative. And so we had these focus groups outside of City Council and brought that back in. It's a struggle just to get these voices heard, but I wanted to bring what you were talking about back into it because you mentioned how in so many states, felons can't vote um, permanently. Also, just thinking about like voter suppression, there are millions and millions of youth in this country who deserve the right to vote too. Our voices should be heard. The voices of people who are under 18 should also have a say in who's gonna be leading this country, right? Um, so there are some kids in Ohio right now, again, Ohio is like the prettiest girl at prom every four years um, because of the presidential election. But there are kids in Ohio right now because the speaker of Ohio won't allow the kids to vote in the primaries because they're 17. And so he's interpreting this law saying like, um, because you're 17, you can't vote in the primaries. Ohio primary is March 15th. So there are four 17 year olds right now. And I just wanna shout them out um, and wish them luck because I agree. It's important that we like make our voices heard and people vote, but also we have that power to awaken our democracy right now. So that's where I'll leave it. It's a great point. Uh, let's take a couple more questions. Uh, the microphone is open. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Alfonso Diaz from Colombia. Uh, the the issue that I want to raise is uh, to what extent uh, progressive uh, views, progressive movements. Um, uh, overestimate the the nature of of of, of, of this country. Uh, the the this is a very conservative country. If, if you think about it, I mean, uh, no, no, I mean the very fact that uh, somehow a, a socialist uh, had to some, uh, sneak his way. Into into the into the process by 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 uh, playing the card of, of, of belonging to the one of the two uh, duopoly uh, sa uh, par parties uh, tells you a lot. Uh, compare it with uh, well obvious comparison. Uh, I would say apples to apples. Uh, Europe were uh, and and then the history of of. Uh, 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 identifies as identifying as a communist um, uh, in the in the in the 40s and, and 50s. Of even if you actually were not, could 
led you to uh, ostracizing and, and, and the worst case scenarios of being uh, given the Rosenberg's <laughs> uh, deal. Uh, so uh, has the, pro has the, uh, the, the the question is, have the progressives uh, failed in, in uh, making the country uh, progressive, the society? Thank you, sir. That's a great question. Young man. Uh, hi. My name is Liam Riley, Columbia College. I use he, him, his um, pronouns. Um, and I'm just thinking about, um, with the increased representation of queer and trans people of color, especially black people uh, like Laverne Cox, Janet Mock, uh, TV shows, um, but then along with that, seeing the increased rate of like youth homelessness in these communities, um, uh, young people at like 13, like feeling pressured to come out, um, and how we don't have the structural changes to support these people. Um, so I'm just wondering uh, what you feel about having representation in the media, but not in the government, um, and if it's even beneficial if we don't have the structural changes to support these um, young people. Thank you. Hi. Hi, my name is Miriam Callahan. I'm from the School of General Studies. Um, my question is that kind of relates back to the other two. In progressive spaces, in progressive organizations, it seems like so much work is done and so much talk is dedicated to keeping back the encroachment of like the hyper masculine neoliberal social order and this just fighting against these structures that are in place um, and doing everything we can to maintain dignity in these spaces. Um, my question is, what is your vision of a structure and a society and an order that is different from that? What, would, what does it look like to have a society and a government and a power structure that is not hyper-masculine, that is uh, more just, more equal, um, and, and um, that really represents everybody in our democracy. Thank you. Thank you. So three questions there, and I'm going to let um, the panel decide which ones they want to take. The first one about the misjudging of the, the, the nature of this country, that are we in fact not a colorblind society? Are we not, in fact, a very conservative society that has always relied on white males as, and white conservative males as the epitome of who we are as a country? And that sort of feeds into the next two questions, which, you know, the representation of, in, in the media, like people like Janet Mock, who's a friend of mine, um, uh, but not in government. And why is that important, if at all, if we don't have the infrastructure in place? to make that, and finally, what does it look like? What does that society look like if we do have those things in place? Well, I just, I mean, th taking all those questions together, I just, I, th I think I wanna return to something that was sort of mentioned previously by Professor Thomas, which is that, to me, this all relates to a question of sort of like the hazards of identity politics, which coming from me, you know, I work at a project called the LGBT Project. It is, at its core, an identity-based mm -hmm. advocacy framework. But I think, you know, as a lawyer, you know, I think it's very dangerous to sort of operate within an individual rights framework. And sort of the reality of this country, of course, is that we haven't had like a, a robust labor movement. And we haven't had like robust demands for, for single payer, universal health care and other things. And so when we're constantly chipping away and, ac and, and seeking access to individual uh, goods and not think seeking distributive justice, I think we are sort of left with the sort of capitalist structure that we have um, and that we aren't making these demands and so I you know I think in my work for example every time we're advocating for trans health care or something related to, to access to health care for people living with HIV for, for trans people we're not at making a demand to change the entire health structure and health system which is in fact the problem which is the reason why people are dying is because of how we distribute health care it's not because trans people are excluded I mean so many people are excluded and of course there's individual biases within the system but I think you know we should be making more trans transformative demands, and those demands should be redistributive at their core, um, and, and really think about taking resources and distributing out rather than increasing access to, to sort of the, the sort of rights-based frameworks that we have set up in our legal system. Can I come Please. in on this? Yes. I, I want to try to integrate all three of the questions as well. Um, some of you have heard about the research that has been done, which shows, I think beyond a shadow of a doubt, 
that one of the things that characterizes American life today is something that um, researchers have called the empathy gap. And this fundamental inability uh, that we have um, to think about ourselves uh, in or from the shoes of the other. Right? Um, it is uh, perfectly compatible with the rampant hyper-individualism uh, that is a feature of the neoliberal condition uh, and the way in which we see ourselves principally in terms of our individual interests, um, what we can consume, uh, what we can earn, what we can buy. Uh, that way of seeing ourselves absolutely cuts us off from any possibility of imagining ourselves in any deep way as part of what Benedict Anderson the late British political theorist called the imagined community of the nation. Uh, we don't even talk about ourselves very much um, as being part of uh, a broader community that is larger than our local communities. Uh, we see ourselves as tax taxpayers. We talk about the American people, but that idea is a very thin one because it doesn't weave us together um, in a network of mutual civic belonging. We have lost that vision uh, of ourselves. And so I would like to see, um, in, th in thinking about, specifically about this question of the politics of, of, of gender and the insight of the feminist movement, the modern feminist movement that uh, the personal is political and the 19th century feminist movement uh, in its practice, which emerged as a movement that worked first on what? Abolition. I would like to see us um, move, reclaim a vision of the practice of democratic freedom, which is not rooted in our local individual identities and our narrow individual interests, but is broad enough to claim solidarity, right? and which is crucially important, uh, because I think more and more of what we're seeing is that all of us have a linked fate. Right? And so men, for example, uh, who are buying into these narrow, I think ultimately um, murderous, suicidal understandings of what it means to be a man ought to be invested in gender justice in a way that they're just not going to see uh, if the representatives of power are figures like Mr. Trump. So I, I want to come back to this question of uh, democracy as, first and foremost, a way of imagining ourselves, um, of, of taking a cold, sober look at who we are, but also taking a risk uh, to experiment with who we might become. And contrary to what uh, the first question uh, said, I don't think, I think that that has been a, that process of democratic invention is part of our legacy as a people. Um, it is a legacy, however, that we have uh, forgotten um, and been encouraged in many, many ways to abandon with the rise of an anti-democratic politics. So that legacy, uh, that the vision of gender justice um, and of um, the feminist movement in particular uh, offers to us is one that I think at this particular moment absolutely needs to be recovered. Um, <clears throat> I'm getting the wrap uh, notice here. Uh, before, we, before we do wrap up though, um, this has been enlightening for me. I've learned so much in just being here. Um, and what Professor Thomas just said is interesting because I was going to ask for some final thoughts from our panelists and I was going to ask, was going to ask you to frame it in the idea of hope, which is, you know, I, as you heard in uh, my introduction, I spent uh, th almost three years in West Africa covering all sorts of things going on in West Africa. The very last thing I did before I moved back to New York was the kidnapping of these 300 schoolgirls from um, their, their schools in northeastern Nigeria. And I can tell you, as, as a matter of fact, and it's what we reported, that the government had no interest in getting these girls back at all. Why? Because they're girls. 
that was the position of the Nigerian government, the you know, ninth largest country in the world, our biggest partner, trading partner in Africa, where we get more oil from than we do from Saudi Arabia. That was the position of the government, that these were just girls, they were probably married off to these terrorists and there's nothing you can do about it. Meanwhile, there's a group of women every day, every day since I left Nigeria, it's been almost a, it's gonna be a year next month, um, uh, two years next month, they go out and they sit, just these moms and sisters and daughters, a couple of guys with them, every day in front of the president's house to just protest silently, hoping that these girls will someday come home to their families. So whilst we have these issues that are facing us in this country and we're looking with awe and surreal, you know, <laughs> to me it's, it's a little bit frightening what we're seeing in our political process now, is there, is there light at the end of the tunnel? at some point, at least here? Dana? Yes, please. <laughs> um, I think we have to look to the light or we're doomed and screwed and can't move forward or get out of bed. And I really appreciate what Professor Thomas was saying about this crisis of connection, which I think is one of the real keys to the, the crisis and the solution, is that how, and there are many, many ways, we don't have time to talk about them, but how do we, get back in touch with our innate human desire to connect and to empathize and to have strong relationships and to actually believe that we're in it together and not alone, that actually together we will all go further than if we keep focusing on the individuals. Turner? Yeah, I think there's hope, but catch it. So I think there's hope because I think it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Mm. And once it gets so bad that like, my friend Octavia Lewis always says, or quotes James Baldwin, they come for me during the day, but they'll return for you at night. And once they come back for you and like, once it hits close enough to home for everyone to stand up and awaken our democracy, that's when I think it'll get better. I love like American history. And I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that like one of the, starters of the American Revolution was like the Boston Tea Party. Like they were mad because they were getting taxed over tea, right? So they went onto this ship and started a revolution. Once enough people get put in jail, once enough of our girls get raped and kidnapped and murdered, once enough of like people start to lose their homes um, and their jobs and their livelihoods, that's when I think we'll band together and, and really awaken our democracy. Thank you, uh, Chase. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think there's there's definitely reason to be hope and hopeful and, and sort of for me, and I think going back to, to sort of the organizing and distributive justice piece, you know, some of the most amazing organizing I've ever seen is by people inside prisons and jails who are doing the transformative labor of keeping each other alive under horrible conditions, and I think we have a lot to learn about sort of that type of labor, that emotional support under incredibly harsh conditions, and I think the more we let people out of jail and listen to their lessons of sort of the conditions under which we kept them and how they kept each other alive, alive and supported and connected, I think we have a lot to learn and I think there's reason to be hopeful. Professor Thomas. I have a lot of hope um, as I look around this room because uh, the majority of you are students and one of the things that we know about your generation is that you have quite self-consciously and critically rejected a way of seeing yourselves uh, and your uh, horizons in life in the narrow terms that have characterized uh, my generations and generations closer to me. And um, my hope is built, uh, in the words of the old Protestant hymn, um, on a faith that you will hold on to that vision of yourselves, which is precisely a connectional analysis, a, a connectional um, um, a vision of yourselves, and a connectional analysis of how the issues that you care about cannot be addressed uh, separate from the issues that involve other people. So that vision um, that you are forging and offering to the rest of us gives me great hope. So I can walk out of this room, uh, even though we've talked about some pretty depressing things, um, optimistic about a future in which we will transform the way we see um, and the way we live out what it means to be uh, a democracy or a society that aspires to be a democracy. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. And so am I. Thank you very much. This was great. Appreciate it. <laughs>
so I know that I know that our panelists. What, just one sec. I know our panelists have all given you quite a lot of food for thought, and I want to invite you to share your ideas with us at University Life at Columbia.edu, where we can then share them out via our social media. I also want to ask you, if you'd like, uh, you'll receive the link to this video uh, in your email. Share it out as well, uh, and, and continue to engage in the conversation. And now please join me in thanking all of our panelists for a very rich and engaging discussion.